daughter of a of a real genuine wise guy a jewish gangster my grandfather my maternal grandfather louis adelson so tonight we're going to explore the dark side the dark side of the jewish immigrant experience and we're going to look at gangsters in the new york metropolitan area and well beyond the focus of tonight's program is going to be the period of prohibition to the end of world through the end of world war ii and this was a time when Jewish gangsters, along with their Italian partners, dominated crime in America. The Jewish gangsters forgotten. Why? It's a Shonda, someone you don't want to remember. Someone who really didn't leave a family legacy. So when you say gangster or organized crime, what do you think of? You think mafia? Maybe you'll think of Maya Lansky, the brain behind the brawn who continued his career down in Florida or Bugsy Siegel because of the great movie with Warren Beatty. The story is more extensive and it goes back to the 19th century. And it's not just about the leaders and names you might know, but the ones who work for them. It's a cast of maybe thousands. So on the right-hand side, you see Shia, who I'm named after, Samuel Adelson, my great-grandfather, Louis's father, a very pious and mostly unemployed um, stonecutter who spent his days in shul praying for work while his wife Fager, you see him in the middle of that family picture, worked her fingers to the bone as the superintendent of a tenement in Brownsville, Brooklyn, New York. Kind of a tree grows in Brooklyn. Two of the five sons, my grandfather, Louis, and his kid brother, Nate, followed a path very unlike that of their third cousin, RCA founder David Sarnoff. Louis was in the Brownsville Boys and worked for Murder Incorporated leader Lepke Buckholder as a slugger, an enforcer. And Nate, Nate served five years in Sing Sing for union racketeering. My grandmother, Louis's wife, Julia, well, she had lots of skeletons in her closet. And growing up, I'd hear, you know, you listen to adult conversation, you heard stories. My great grandmother's oldest sister, they had children very young, so I knew all these people, but she would tell me stories. And I thought, you know, Bubba Mices. And then finally, in 1972, The Godfather came out. My grandfather went to see it. And I was visiting him, and he said to me, Cookie, they kill people. And for the first time, Grandpa brought up his past, told me stories, some but not all. They were to come later on. Also said the stories that my, my grandmother's Aunt Ida, my great-grandmother's older sister, had told me about the bars, which were brothels on the Lower East Side. He said they were true. Now, don't Google Louis Adelson. You're never going to find his name in any books. He was a soldier in this army of hoodlums. And like soldiers, he didn't like to talk about it, but he talked enough. One thing I do remember he told me was the three commandments. You don't steal from other gangsters, you don't lie to other gangsters, and you never, never rat on gangsters. Years after his death, I came to visit my mother who lived in this apartment, and I had photocopied some pictures without names from a book about gangs, Jewish gangsters. And she goes, oh, Oh, she recognized them as family friends, talk lovingly about them, including one who was an incorrigible thug who we'll get to later on, who lived with them for a while on Hinsdale Street in East New York, Brooklyn. That's when I really started to get interested and to study the history of Jewish gangsters in America. Once Upon a Time in America, by the way, a great movie. Um, historically, a very small percentage of every immigrant group turns to crime, a way out of poverty, something that appeals to adolescent boys, some who involve, evolved into criminal men. Some of these fired our imagination, but most have been forgotten. This is the story of not so nice Jewish boys and men who went to shul in the morning and created mayhem after Shabbos was over. To those incredulous to hear about the existence of Jewish gangsters, we have to remember most immigrants then and now 
did not start life at the finish line. Now, a few things stand out, and some of these will be repeated, and we'll hear uh, stories associated with it as we go on, but Jewish gangsters, for the most part, went to shul at least on the high holy days. They were devoted family men who were good to their mothers in particular, and who tried to keep the activities secret from their families. They presented themselves as businessmen. Unlike the Italian gangsters, sons and family members were not included. They did everything they could to keep their brothers, nephews, cousins, and then later on their sons out of the, fam out of the business. What did the Jews want their children to become? You guessed it, doctors, lawyers, accountants, respectable. Gangster activity, So these Jews came to these densely populated urban districts, for the most part coming to the um, uh, East Coast. The most notorious area was the Lower East Side. Uh, most of these gangsters were the children of Eastern European Jews, not all. And the great period of immigration was from 1880 until 1917. And by 1917, the Jewish immigrant population had grown, had grown from a quarter of a million to 3.3 million, 9% of all immigrants. And these mobsters grew up in traditional homes, not generally strictly orthodox. Uh, in other words, they might bench left on Friday nights, as my grandmother did, they would keep kosher um, so that their mothers could come over and eat with them, but they might go to the movies or out for Chinese food, kind of a folk Judaism. And most of these gangsters continued this, these behavioral Jewish patterns into adulthood where Jewish ritual to some extent remained an indelible part of who and what they were. And they came to the golden land that was not so golden. They left poverty and anti-Semitism in the old country and they found it here. Plus there was a traumatic transition from shtetl to tenement and a loss of structure a loss of, of structure, something that um, sociologists call anime. There's a disintegration or sometimes a disappearance of the norms and values common to a society. This was the environment that spawned gangsters who almost entirely preyed on other gangsters. They preyed on their own. This was the environment that spawned these gangsters where anti-Semitism was prevalent and growing you had the KKK, Henry Ford. I could never buy a Ford, sorry. Uh, and the, 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 the garbage that he spewed with the, with the uh, elders of Zion conspiracy that we control the world. School quotas, economic discrimination, and that wasn't just from Gentiles. That was also from highly assimilated German Jews. So blocked from respectable avenues to success, they found different routes. Sports was very big, especially boxing, very big. Later it was basketball. The entertainment industry, hey, Jews founded the entertainment industry in Hollywood and dominated the great white, white way. And lastly, crime. A crime was easy money. The lure of quick money and the power and the romance of a criminal lifestyle attracted the, the children of Jewish and Italian immigrants an alternative to sweatshops, grueling. In gangs, they found solidarity, loyalty, rites of passage to manhood, and some forbidden adult activities. Louis, my grandfather, went to work at the age of nine, dropping out of school to help support a family of seven. Grandpa, the poor and powerless, found money and uh, and power in the burgeoning gangs of Brownsville, New York. But the roots of crim criminality actually began in the 19th century with German Jews. And Jews, the Jews had a spotless reputation as America's most law-abiding citizens, but that began to tarnish. The first criminals were middle-class children of German Jewish shopkeepers. Uh, maybe like petty thieves, confidence men rarely resorted to physical violence. 
Unfortunately, this soon evolved into violent gangs and these master criminals who always dressed classy. They dressed like businessmen. The first one was Monk Eastman. Um, he started out with, in, in building his first big street gang with prostitution and gambling rings. But the big thing he started was hiring out his thugs. Thugs for hire, including hiring them out for politics. Um, particularly Tammany Hall, that was the uh, Democratic machine in New York City for a long time. And these, these thugs would make people vote for whom they were told to vote for and not just vote one time. He was succeeded by Max Wyback. He was called Kid Twist. That was his nickname. A lot of these guys had, had nicknames. And he was called Kid Twist by the way he liked to kill people by twisting their neck. Um, he also was a, was a ladies man. And um, he was a lover of my great grandmother, uh, Minnie. Uh, he met my great grandmother in her older sister's brothel on the Lower East Side. People say, are you sure you're Jewish? And I go, yes, absolutely. But we have a dark past also. Big Jack Zelig next controlled it, also using thugs for hire. And I love the names of some of his thugs. These nicknames are just, I love them. Lefty Louie. And my, my favorite nickname for, of all time was Jip the Blood. On the right-hand side, you see a guy who was not dressed in a business suit, and that was Dopey Benny Fine. Um, he was a member of the Eastman Gang, and he was the first prominent Jewish labor racketeer. Very strong union man, and even when the bosses gave him a lot of money. In 1910, they offered him $15,000, and that was a lot of money back then, but no, he was a union man all the way. How did he end his life? as a very successful garment manufacturer. Criminal gangs started fading, soon to be overtaken by much more powerful gangsters whose power went well beyond the Lower East Side. But the alliances and the experiences in these early gangs set the stage for the next chapter because in 1920, something happened in America that would open up great opportunity for these bums. And that was the 18th Amendment, prohibition. Prohibition turned the underworld into business world. And after prohibition, Jewish gangsters dominated the New York criminal underworld. 50%, it's mind blowing, 50% of all major bootleggers in America were Jewish. Lots of money was created and there was a need for organization and, and structure for this thing. And that soon came under the next person we're gonna talk about. Meanwhile, crime appealed to them because it was a way to become a somebody, to move up and out. Legitimate work was hard and dull and it offered very slow social mobility if any, slow economic mobility. Crime was exciting. It was a challenge for these men of ability and aggressiveness and daring. Men with Yiddish settle who were able to take risks. The other thing is that Jewish gangsters, like other gangsters, saw themselves as providing a service. Victimless crimes. If people wanted booze, if people wanted drugs, if people wanted to gamble, if people wanted illicit sex, they furnished them. Unfortunately, physical violence became accepted as a tool of the trade, a way to eliminate competition and protect your interests. And this is the guy who turned these bums into businessmen, Arnold Rothstein. And he did not come from the slums. He was the son of a very well-to-do, upstanding, Upper West Side, German Jewish businessman, Abraham Rothstein, Abe the Just, who owned dry goods stores and a cotton processing plant, was very prosperous. His son, Arnold, was a mathematical genius, but very uninterested in, in, as a student. His protégés called him the PhD. That was short for Papa Hot Gelt, or Dad Has Money. He started gambling very young. That turned out to be his Achilles heel. 
He later on said it was a way to show his father that he couldn't be controlled. On Shabbos, on Shabbat, he would take his father's money while his father was in shul, gamble it. Fortunately, he won and he replaced the gambling money. In 10, he was running his own casino and then he started investing in racetracks. And how did he get the money? His father's banking community, no questions asked. A son of Abe the Just, he must be doing good. Now he may or may have not fixed the 1919 World Series. He was never indicted. He was never indicted for anything. And then he married a Gentile girl and his father set Shiva for him. Now he could do what he wanted. And he recognized prohibition as a great business opportunity. So he expanded and diversified into bootlegging and later, well, not too much later, into narcotics. He had holdings in speakeasies and brothels and gambling establishments and nightclubs and everything had to be classy. He wanted no part of anything that wasn't totally classy or that he could not control. I'm sure everybody has seen Funny Girl with Nikki Ornstein was going to um, take a job in a casino that was one of Arnold Rothstein's casinos. Always very classy, very big on customer service. Um, and he understood the law that he broke and he encouraged his protégés and there were many to take the Fifth Amendment. He understood business and negotiation and how to make alliances and he passed these learnings on to his many protégés. Lent money to politicians. They didn't have to pay him back. He got paid back all right with major favors. Always the brains lurking in the background, never getting his own hands dirty. Even though it was strange from his father, when his father ran into business problems, remember, this is the 20s. He secured a $300,000 anonymous bank loan for his father, still took care of him. In 1928, he ran into a streak of very bad luck. He just couldn't win. He had a lot of gambling debts and at a meeting trying to resolve these, he was shot, mortally wounded, died three days later. Buried in a talit in an orthodox ceremony, except he had a $5,000 a bronze casket. And his father stood in front of a large crowd and said Kaddish for his son once again. Now, the business of crime was not just bootlegging and prostitution and gambling. It also was involved with narcotics and union racketeering. Um, narcotics. There's a fallacy that Jewish gangsters didn't get into narcotics. I hate to tell you, the Jewish gangsters started it and controlled it. It was Rothstein. He saw that prohibition wasn't going to last. And substitute. And it was easy to buy these drugs. Legitimate French and German pharmaceutical firms, particularly Bayer, yes, as in Bayer aspirin, uh, they had no problem selling large amounts of heroin and morphine and cocaine to these gangsters. Give you an idea of how profitable this was. In 1923, five pounds of heroin bought in Germany for $2,000 sold in New York for $300,000. After repeal, the narcotics trade increased and Jews were soon joined by the Italians. And after World War II, the Italians took control. I will tell you one thing though, Jews never cut their drugs and the Italians did. Back in 34 though, there were problems in Germany. We don't have to explain that. Um, and they lost the contacts in Germany and lost the ability to buy drugs in Germany. Yiddish Sechel went to China, set up um, Chinese heroin factories and taught the Chinese how to make heroin. Labor racketeering was common um, before prohibition, but it really started to, to grow after prohibition. Now, Jewish gangsters on the whole were mostly pro-union, uh, particularly during strikes, but after the strike was settled, they, will they would infiltrate and take over, forcing the unions to take on extra men, their men, including my grandfather, Louis, who became a house painter for the union when he wasn't busy busting skulls. And Jewish gangsters, of course, went into the garment district, 
where the boss is. What kind of district? I'm, I'm trying to speak. Who, who's speaking? Okay, they went into the garment district. Um, and, and many say that in, in some respects, the um, the um, racketeering started out as a rebellion against these bosses, and it was an issue of uptown versus downtown Jews. So the heart of organized crime. One second, is somebody trying to reach me? Yeah, thank you. Yes, please mute yourselves. Um, so the heart of organized crime was the Lower East Side, but that soon, soon spread across the East River into Brooklyn, then throughout America, wherever there was water and good highways, except Chicago, that was always controlled by Capone and some Irish gangs. The big six of Jewish bootlegging, Lepke Buchholzer, Dutch Schultz, Meyer Lansky, Bugsy Siegel, Charles King Charles Solomon, who controlled Boston, and Newark's own Abner Longies Wilman. But again, these were just the bosses. There were tons of gangster. The soldiers were immigrant or first generation of Eastern European parentage, mostly city bred, now in their early 20s. Their parents, again, working class traditional. Uh, they'd observed Jewish traditions and holidays, but they were not following strict halakhic laws. Typically, these gangsters uh, never got as far as finishing high school. Uh, importantly, though, they were very attached to their families through their entire lives. And usually, but not always, they were the only criminal in their immediate family. Very often, uh, their siblings went on more respectable paths with gangster money supplied by their brothers. How did the American Jewish community feel about what was going on. They were really ambivalent. Um, they were fearful that the, these criminal activities would affect them. And it wasn't an idle co concern because in the 20s and 30s, American anti-Semitism was exploding. Besides Henry Ford and the KKK, you had Farva Charles Coughlin on the radio. And then you had the German American Bund starting in the late 20s and into the 30s, having rallies, anti-Semitic rallies throughout America. The American Jewish community feared gangsters. I think they really feared anti-Semitism even more. They were, they were concerned that the, the children, their children, their sons would be attracted to gangster lifestyle, but the gangsters did everything they did to dissuade youngsters. They never actively recruited youngsters and ended up sending many Jewish kids to college. You saw a growth of a grudging admiration of these don't mess with me tough Jews, kind of a positive image when faced with the worst gangsters of all, the Nazis. So I could do an hour on Lansky and I have, um, he's one, but we'll make it very abbreviated. Um, he's one of the most well-known figures because his life of crime continued into his old age. He was born in a Russian-controlled area of Poland. Um, pogroms were going on, and he always said he was Polish. He never said he was Russian. He hated the Russians. And in the old country, he was a victim of anti-Semitism and poverty. Comes to the Lower East Side, and what does he find? Anti-Semitism and poverty. Um, early on, he met Bugsy Siegel, who we'll get to in a little while, um, and he ran a gang with Siegel. And that was one of the first gangs following on uh, the precedent set by the Eastman Gang to hire out men, but this time not just for violence, not just to get votes, but for murder itself. Lansky also met friends and partners in the bootlegging trade. I'm going to stop for a minute, and whoever is on, can you please silence yourself? It's very, very disruptive. Thank you. Thank you. So Lansky and Luciano were key in forming the syndicate. You might have heard of the syndicate if you watched old crime shows. 
um, on television, but the National Crime Syndicate was founded in Atlantic City in 1925. And this was a con business conference that linked together the Italian, Irish, and Jewish gangs, including the big six. If you ever saw Boardwalk Empire on HBO, it was very realistic. Uh, these guys, Lansky and these other guys, turned organized crime into a real business run like a corporation with a board of directors and no more boss of bosses. Lansky, he was the financial mastermind behind it. He managed the money. He financed major programs, bribed authority figures. He learned that from his mentor, Arnold Rothstein. Now, he focused on gambling operations, but he himself never gambled because as a young boy on the Lower East Side, his mother gave him money to go buy some challah for, the, for Shabbat, and he got involved in a crapshoot. He lost his mother's money, and he himself never gambled again. He helped um, develop Murder Incorporated, the enforcement branch, which we'll get into more detail later on. Um, and then expanded his business into New Orleans, Florida, and Cuba. Very, very successful. Like Rothstein, he was a mathematical genius, and he understood the odds in wagering games. He also had the strong mob connections and bribery of law enforcement agents, and together it ensured the security of his establishments. He continued a lifelong uh, business influence with the um, Italian American mafia, sometimes called the mob's accountant. He himself was short, even tempered, meticulous dresser and exhibited quiet class. You'd never know what his business really was. He was a very devoted family man. One of his sons was born with cerebral palsy and his father was racked with guilt trying to find a way to, to cure his son. Uh, other son, Paul, you see in the military uniform, actually ended up going to West Point um, without his father's help, kind of in spite of who his father was. And his daughter, uh, Sandy, well, she loved her papa. And we'll get to her in a little while, but she always spoke lovingly. Lansky can Florida a little later on, the magic city. So he did live fast, he did die young, but he did not have a good looking corpse. Benjamin Siegelbaum, born in abject poverty in Williamsburg and vowed to rise above it. Very violent nature. This was a very, very violent man. By the age of 14, he had started a gang protecting pushcart peddlers. Grandpa knew him, told me Benny, because you never called him Bugsy, said he was as crazy as they come. It was called a chaya. Chaya is Yiddish for an animal, untamed. Um, he was among the founding members and chief operating officers of Murder Incorporated, um, mainly as a hitman and as a muscle man. After control of, of the enforcement uh, branch of, of the syndicate went to Buckhalder and Anastasia to run the Italian part of it, he still continued as a hitman. He himself murdered over 30 people, not including those whose murder he arranged or those he killed with other enforcers. He was a bootlegger. Then he ran gambling operations. In 1936, he moved to L.A. He was actually moved to L.A. He was a, a, a loose cannon, very difficult to control, had a terrible temper um, and was a very, very violent man. So he started running operations, uh, which weren't as small as they were on the East Coast getting involved with gambling operations and drugs. And then he found gold in LA. He found gold in Hollywood, where he did want to be a movie star, but he started extorting the movie studios. He would take over the local trade unions like the LA Teamsters or the Screen Extras Guild, not actors, the Screen Extras Guild. And he would stage these strikes to force the studios to pay him off <clears throat> so that, the, that the movies could start working again. He hung out with celebrities. He borrowed a lot of money for over $400,000 from various celebrities. We're talking about the 30s, never paid anybody back. And it was in LA that he developed the dream of Las Vegas. He was assassinated in 1947. 
at the age of 41. And there's a lot of different theories about why he was assassinated. My favorite is Maya Lansky's daughter, Sandy. And I guess she got this from her dad, but she said that Lucky Luciano was trying to get out of going uh, to prison for life. He had been in jail already, was out of jail, and they wanted to put him in for life. And his lawyer, nice Jewish man, of course, Moses Polakoff, starts complaining because they're waiting for Siegel. And Siegel's late because Siegel was supposed to pick up the bagels. How could you have a meeting without bagels? And Moses. And Luciano is getting, his anger is getting stoked. And finally, Siegel walks in the door. And Luciano says, what do you mean you're late? To which Siegel turned around and said, go F yourself. Lansky, even Lansky couldn't save Bugsy. The only person who could tell Lucky Luciano where to go was Lansky. And as we're going to see in the next slide, he did that already. The matzo pizza bromance between the Italians and the Jews. So as teenagers, Lansky met Luciano, who tried to shake him down. And Lansky was slight of build, and, and Luciano was a tough guy. Uh, and basically, he looked up at, at uh, Luciano and told him to go F himself. And that, my friends, was the start of a great friendship. Luciano said Maya was his blood brother. Their friendship, their alliance reflects the powerful alliance between Jews and Italians who together fought off the Irish gangs in the slums and soon realized that they were more alike and different than different. And in growing up in New York, the running joke was, how do you tell the difference between a Jew and an Italian? The Italians were across. These young Jewish gangsters were not like the old timers, not like the old Sicilianos called Mustache Pete's who brought with them into America the anti-Semitism that they were brought up with in the old country. In fact, the Jews and the Italians teamed up to get rid of the boss of bosses. Grandpa spoke Italian. Grandpa listened to opera. His Italian buddies all spoke Yiddish. When Luciano was finally deported to Italy, he claimed the thing he missed the most was Jewish food, particularly corned beef and pastrami on rye. And believe me, he did not have it with mayonnaise. Ralph, Ralph Salerno. I'm going to stop for a minute. I'm going, I'm going to go into the participants to see if I could. Yeah. There we go. Can you hear me? Okay, good. Sorry, I had to cut in, but it's disruptive to hear the noise in the background. So um, you, know, you get to be 73 years old and, and you get disrupted. You forget words like the and and. Okay, so it's explained like this. It's a marriage of convenience. They were together in the slums at the same time. And they create a marriage of what they call the three M's, moxie. That means chutzpah. Muscle and money. The Jews put up the moxie. The Italians. The so this is about a um, Irvin Wexler called we Waxy Gordon, who you probably never heard of. Um, he had his power taken when he messed with the wrong people. He was not murdered by the mob but he was set up by the mob. Um, he started out in the gangs, the Lower East Side. He was a pickpocket named Waxy. He put his hand in your pocket and was like it was lying with wax. He'd lift your wallet, you wouldn't even know it. Then he became an enforcer for Dopey Benny, racketeering. Um, he was a slammer. Uh, slamming is you take a metal pipe and wrap it with newspapers to hit your victims. Then he met Arnold Rothstein. He was a gr grub ying, you know, very rough guy from the streets. And he, Rothstein, but no, Rothstein noticed that this guy who was very, very rough around the edges, had a good brain. So Waxy started a, uh, to launch a career in bootlegging and uh, gambling casinos. And it was he 
who had a brilliant proposition to Rothstein. He said, instead of running Canadian booze through Detroit by truck, let's use speedboats. Aha, a blinding glimpse of the obvious. And Rothstein said, speedboats? How about ships? And let's not just do Canada. Let's get the good stuff from Scotland and Ireland as well. And so they didn't have a uh, rot gut that could make you go blind. This was a very successful bootlegger who tried to emulate a, a wasp. Um, he was married to a rabbi's daughter, instant class. He dressed immaculately. We have, uh, we have a receipt that showed that he bought hand-stitched silk boxers in 1925 for $45 for a pair. He had two homes, a mansion on the New Jersey Palisades with a moat. And then he had a, a sprawling Upper West Side apartment in New York. Now, when these gangsters made money, they had enough money to get out of the Lower East Side, get out of Brownsville, Brooklyn. Uh, they moved to the Upper West Side because they could not move to the Upper East Side. Gentlemen's agreement. Anyway, Waxy had libraries with leather-bound books he never read. What did his family think? He was a successful businessman always posed as a businessman. And then he got into a feud with Lansky and Luciano in 27. Uh, basically, he hijacked a shipment of bootleg booze and he was still protected because Rothstein died the next year. So what did Lansky do? What did Lansky and Luciano do? They didn't kill him. This was before Murder Incorporated started. They let the feds get him on tax evasion. See, Waxy had an unreported income in 1930 of $1.4 million on which he paid the astounding amount of $10.76 in taxes. 1933, at a tax ev evasion trial led by Thomas Dewey, whose name's gonna come up as we see, um, he was convicted and sent to jail. And this shattered the illusion that his family had of respectability. His son was pre-med at the University of North Carolina. Um, and his son traveled home because he couldn't believe this was happening. His father was not a criminal. His father was an upstanding businessman who went to shul. On the way home, he had an ice storm in North Carolina and died. This man who tried to insulate his respectable family from his organized crime career, well, he failed in his, after his son's death, his marriage failed. His wife got a get. Waxy went to jail for 10 years. Got out later on, got involved in heroin and died of a heart attack. And I have that picture because I used to go to this great bagel place in Flushing on Main Street and Waxy Gordon is buried across the street. So I did mention Murder Incorporated. I mentioned Murder Incorporated. Um, let me go into a little more details about it. This was, these were nothing more than professional assassins who took murder contracts from mob bosses throughout the United States. When it first started, Siegel was running it. He was too hot-headed. So they put Lepke Buckholder in charge, along with a man named Albert Anastasia, who ran the Italian end of it. Uh, primarily enforced by Jewish and Italian gangs of Brownsville, East New York, and Ocean Hill, Brooklyn, New York. The Brownsville boys were led by Rabe Ellis and a man named Bugsy Goldstein. Uh, you see Bugsy on the bottom on the left next to Edward G. Robinson. When Edward G. Robinson was looking for someone to base um, Little Caesar on for that famous movie, he picked Bugsy Goldstein. That's who he modeled Little Caesar after. Also by Lepke's Union Thugs. I have no idea if grandpa ever killed anybody. I would dare ask him. But I do know that no one was murdered. This was a contract. No one was murdered unless it was voted on and ordered by the syndicate. They killed their own people. I'll give you an example. Dutch Schultz, the only famous gangster from the Bronx. So he was weakened by two tax evasion trials. That's how they got these guys, led by Thomas Dewey again. And he wanted to kill Dewey. And he goes to the, the uh, board of directors, 
of a syndicate and he asked permission to kill Dewey. They, they absolutely refused him. This, is, this would be a terrible thing. And Schultz disobeyed. He tried to kill Dewey, it failed. So what did the syndicate do? They killed Dutch Schultz. The guys hung out at, um, uh, at a, a candy store. Uh, and it was on Saratoga and Livonia, which probably need, means nothing to most of you, but Saratoga and Livonia was about a mile away from a very famous store whose name you probably know called Fortune Ups. It was really down the block from Fortune Ups. How did they kill people? What did they use? Well, they figured guns, knives, ropes, acid, ice pick. I had to put a picture of the ice pick up there. And the ice pick was very sharp and they would jam it through the victim's ear. The most prolific killer was a man named Harry Pittsburgh, Phil Strauss. Why they called him Pittsburgh, Phil, I have no idea, but he um, did over a hundred murders and he traveled around the country with his little case, leather case where he had pants, white shirt, had to change his clothes, a pair of silk underwear, of course, a gun, a rope and an ice pick. Now, Luciano's favorite hitman stands out. First of all, he was not from New York. He was from Toledo, Ohio. His name was uh, Red Levine, Sam Red Levine, red hair, and he was orthodox. He would always wear a kippah under his hat. He kept kosher. He was observant on, on Shabbos. He never planned to murder anyone on Shabbos, but if he had no choice, he would put on his tally, he'd say his prayers, and then he'd go and do the job. So mom remembered these guys very well. My mother, Thelma. She remembered Lepke as a very nice man, but she loved his partner, Jake Garash Shapiro, who gave her horsey rides and bounced her on his knee. Lepke's mother called him Lepkalo, which means little Louis in Yiddish. Later, that was shortened to Lepke. He started in gangs as a kid, in and out of prison. And finally, in 1922, got together with his childhood pal, Jake Garage Shapiro. And the nickname Garara here, well, there's different versions of why he couldn't, uh, his name was Garara. My mother said it's because instead of saying get out of here, he'd say Garara here. First, they worked for Rothstein, but then he worked, they worked through force and fear. Lepke was the brain, Gra the brawn. Lepke said that the trick was a captive union and a captive trade association. That way you get management and labor in your pocket. You skim the dues from labor and you extort the bosses. And lucky Luciano, you know, I guess there's honor among thieves. He said, hey, with the rest of us, it was booze and gambling and whores. But Lefke, he took the bread out of the worker's mouth. This was a very lucrative business between the two of them. 1935, it's estimated that they had 250 men working for them and grossed a million dollars a year, controlling rackets in the garment, trucking, baking, painting, and various motion picture unions. Lepke became the head of Murder Incorporated after Siegel, and his job was to ensure that the syndicate was insulated from any connection to the contract kills. The contract would go to Lepke, sometimes to Anastasia, but usually to Lepke, and then pass down the line one-on-one, -on -one, and nobody knew who put the original contract out. They wanted to keep this clear so they've caught that the person who put out the original contract complaint be implicated. Now, Lepke Buchholzer was the only major mob boss to get the death penalty for murder. He was already in jail, thanks to Thomas Dewey for racketeering, not for racketeering, it was for tax evasion, uh, sorry. And um, he was convicted of an earlier murder. He was ratted on by Abe Rellis, who we're gonna get to in a minute, and a young man he met up in the Catskills named Tic Tac Tannenbaum. And he was executed, electric chair in 44. Um, Garage Shapiro, he actually went to jail. He turned himself in, went to jail. He died in jail of a heart attack. 
Despite the murderous brutality exercised in business affairs, Lepke was a considerate son, a doting husband and father. He barely drank, never gambled. He was a proud Jew, gave money to his mother's shul, attended high holidays, holiday services, and according to a dossier from the FBI, led a quiet home life. Relis, incorrigible thug, short and squat, powerful hands, considered by most to be a psychopathic killer. Very, very violent. And his weapon of choice was an ice pick rammed through the ear right into the brain, so good at this that they thought that the victims died of a cerebral hemorrhage. And mom remembered him as Uncle A.B., who on the lamb, except she didn't know he was on the lamb at the time. My sister and Marjorie, half of her family are very, very uh, proud German Jews, but the other half not so proud Eastern European Jews. And on that side, they were, she's related to Irving Nadel's Nitzberg, who was put on trial for murder based on a testimony by Rellis. So Rellis is controlling the Jewish Murder Incorporated gangs, and we have Albert Anastasia doing the Italians. And it wasn't just New York again, it was all over the country, far away from Manhattan or Brooklyn. And Rellis, he's slippery, he's eluding conviction. But in 1940, things started to go bad. Uh, and he was starting to get implicated in killings and he didn't think he could get out. And he realized if he was convicted, he'd face execution. Meanwhile, his wife gets pregnant and she gets word of what's going on with him. And she said, the only way to get yourself out of this is you just have to turn rat. And that's what he did. That's what he did. He turned rat. And his testimony enabled the police to closed the book on countless murders, just 85 in Brooklyn alone. And he testified in LA and around that Newark. And he had the goods on all the top people, including Bugsy Siegel and Albert Anastasia. It was very, very threatening. Meanwhile, his testimony is opening up the eyes of the New York Jewish community to the tragedy of these Jewish gangsters. And what was hidden or denied was now out in the open. The night before he's going to testi testify against Albert Anastasia, he's found dead outside a window at the Coney Island Half Moon Hotel, where he had been like, like Epstein, like Jeffrey Epstein, he had been under police protection. And they found him in a place that he could not have been found if he fell out the window. The only way he could have landed there is if he had wings. The only way he landed there is he was murdered by the mob. The gangsters used the Caskills in New York as a playground for their various criminal activities. Um, Lepke had a hilltop estate there. Garag had a, uh, kept his wife and kids at a hotel while he had a, a, a house for his girlfriend uh, in another area. And here's TikTok Tannenbaum. Um, who became one of the most accomplished killers. And he started out as a worker in a hotel up there, uh, ended up working for Lepke and became a rat. And he really helped put his boss into the electric chair. I'm sure everybody here has seen Bonanza. This is an amazing story, Gangy Cone. So it seems like there's a guy named Walter Sage who was skimming slot machines on Long Island. He's He's stealing from the mob. And they put out a contract on him. And Pittsburgh Phil Strauss decides that Gangy Cohn is going to be the person to kill his best friend, Walter Sage, and to do it up in the Catskills. So in 1937, Sage is sitting in the front passenger seat, and Cohn is sitting right behind him. They're usually the kill seat, but it's his best friend. He's feeling comfortable. Meanwhile, Pittsburgh Phil Strauss and A. Pretty Levine are following in the second car because they, they weren't quite trusting this was going to happen. And all of a sudden, the car swerves and goes into a ditch and Gangi bolts out and runs into the woods. 
They pull up and there is Walter Sage dead with 32 ice pick wounds. Gangi's gone. Fast forward two years, 1939. And two gangsters are in Midnight Rose's candy store and they're bored, so they go to the movies. They go to the Lowy's Pitkin to see Bill Holden in Golden Boy. The film cuts to a ringside crowd seat before the big fight scene. And there in the middle, there he is, Gangi Cone. They can't believe it. Well, it, you know, if this crime thing doesn't work out, I guess we can always go to Hollywood. Cone got a Hollywood ending, reinventing himself as an actor named Jack Gordon. Um, he found work as an extra and a bit player and usually cast as a heavy. Unfortunately, Pretty Levine had turned stool pigeon. So there were uh, wanted posters with his picture all over uh, post offices in Sullivan County, New York, and a law enforcement officer sees it and gone to the movies, and all of a sudden you have Gangi Cohn being extradited back to Sullivan County to face indictment. But he gets acquitted, he walks away free, and he continues as a bit actor until his death in 1976, playing thugs, playing thugs in Bonanza, and he was the stand-in for Dan Blanca, Hoss. So as I said, it was not just in the New York area. Here's Longies Wellman, called the Al Capone of New Jersey. Al Capone kind of didn't like the fact that they would call people the Al Capone of New Jersey, the Al Capone of Boston, et cetera. He said, there's only one Al Capone. But he was a, he was a partner with, with him in controlling the movie projectionist doing it. This was another man. Um, and he got into the numbers racket. By 1920, he's, he's controlling it with the help of hired muscle. Addicted to making money after growing up so poor and struggling. He said, all I remember was that as kids, my brothers and sisters and I were always hungry. During Prohibition, he started smuggling whiskey, whiskey by ships uh, from Canada into New Jersey. And then he got into other, other areas, uh, gambling, prostitution, racketeering. But he also established very legitimate nightclubs and restaurants. He, his lover, before he got married, was Jean Harlow. He was the one who got her her first picture deal at Columbia Pictures. But he married well. Mary Mendel, well, her father was the president of the American Stock Exchange. Swellman was very close to Capone, and they worked together, as I said, to control the movie projectionist union. No movie projectionists, no movies. Zulman had very strong political influences in New Jersey. Um, he kept law enforcement in his pocket. Yet, despite his reputation as a ruthless mobster, he was very sensitive to his upbringing. A strong Zionist from the get-go, later on, he helped ship arms to Israel, always gave Sadaka, very big on giving Sadaka. When asked why he wouldn't go into a funeral parlor, he said, because I'm a Kohen. He and his wife were very well respected by their neighbors and, and by Newark's entire Jewish community for their charitable work. Unfortunately, in 1959, he was found hanged in his home. His death was ruled a suicide, but police found evidence that he had been tied up, killed before being hung. We don't know who killed him. Most people think it was the mafia. At his funeral, over a thousand people attended and the services were conducted by the president of the American Jewish Congress. In Philly, you had Mo Annenberg who began with a very legitimate job at Hearst and then came up with this great idea, a telegraphic service for bookie joints. How do you get information from racetracks? That's how you do it. The IRS in collecting tax evasion evidence for him found that he had a monopoly on services to all racetracks in America, Canada, Mexico, and Cuba, making bookmaking into a business. His wire service was AT&T's fifth largest customer. 
but he needed muscle to control his business. And that was Capone, who we paid $1 million a year. During the depression, Annenberg's income estimated by the IRS at $6 million a year. He made more than Henry Ford. In 1939, he was afraid that his son, who had nothing to do with his father's business, his father, the son, Walter Annenberg, who later on had a publishing empire, including TV Guide, um, was totally innocent. And the father, to protect his son, just walked away walked away from the business. That was the end of it. And shortly after he died. You also in Philly had Max Hoff. And the only reason I bring him up again, boxing, very, very big. Um, but the amount of money that he was able to net at the beginning of the syndicate in 1929, he was able to net $5 million. Think about this, this is in 1929. This was a very lucrative time for gangsters in America. In Boston, you had King Solomon. Um, and he was, um, he was actually killed by a small time gangster uh, in Massachusetts. But uh, he came, he did not come from poverty. He actually came from a middle class background. Um, he started in the 20s, he started getting into gambling and rum running. That was a big thing. He brought rum from Central America and from Cuba by ship, by ship. Um, a lot of these guys had very, very strong connections also to the Bronfman family in Canada. Canada was not under prohibition and the Bronfmans could make as much booze as they wanted. And the Jewish gangsters found ways of getting it to America. The most violent of all the Jewish gangs was in Detroit, the Purple Gang. In 1919, it was the first US city to go dry and bootlegging started there before it started in the rest of America, transferring booze from Windsor, Ontario to Detroit. Now in 1920, three and a half percent of the population of Detroit was Jewish. It had a fairly large Jewish population. By 1929, the smuggling, manufacturing, and distribution of liquor was the second biggest business in Detroit after the automobile industry, employing 50,000 people. Again, connection with the Bronfmans really helped. Now, this violent gang was actually led by four brothers, originally from New York. So this was unusual. The, the gangs in the Midwest on the whole were run by brothers, not individuals. Uh, they were kind of, and they, they worked with the, they gave the Capone organization good booze. They became part of the syndicate, but they were really, they were very, very sloppy. And they all ended up in jail or, or dead, except for one who ended up living in Florida, like other good Jews, but he worked with Lansky and casinos. Anyway, Yom Kippur, 1929. Two of the Purple Gang members, um, actually it was three of them, go to services at Orthodox Congregation B'nai David in Northwestern Detroit. And they didn't notice three men sitting in the back of the synagogue. And these were G-men, government men, government agents, disguise, disguising themselves to fit in on Yom Kippur. They disguised them some, themselves as Hasidic Jews. And they figured they're gonna grab these three hoodlums after services. But at a break between morning and afternoon services, these G-men go outside and light up cigarettes. And that was the end of their cover and the gangsters got away. Minneapolis was a major center of bootlegging. Also had a decent sized Jewish population. Now here's two of the leaders, um, Dave Berman, now his family did not settle in New York or on the, on the East Coast. They actually settled in Ashley, North Carolina on land provided by Baron Marista Hirsch's Jewish Colonization Association. They would take the Jews, um, rescue them for, after the pogroms and, and have them established as farmers in the Midwest. 
most of them, believe, believe me, failed. Um, so his family failed to farm and they moved to Sioux City, Iowa. And that's where he got his start running big bootlegging operations. Finally moves to Minneapolis. And we always said his bootlegging, op his uh, bookmaking operations next to a kosher restaurant. Although past US enlistment age, when World War II happened, he joined the Canadian army, he said to kill 10 Nazis for every Jew. Wounded in Italy, and where did he end up? He ended up in Vegas, owning the Flamingo after Siegel's murder and then the Riviera, becoming a big philanthropist and his family had no idea who he really was. Kid Khan was another one. His father came to Minnesota from Romania to be a furrier, couldn't get work. Kid had to leave school, support his family. Very, very poor, outraged. And he started another, um, another gang there, again, with his brothers, very different in the Midwest. Where did he end up? He ended up in, in Florida. And one of his jobs, one of his businesses was stock market uh, fraud. And you know, you know that uh, condominium in the middle of the Everglades, a condo. That was Kid Con Blumenfeld. So the deaths of Rellison and, um, and Lepke really signaled the end of Murder Incorporated, uh, uh, end of the, the syndicate for the most part, and the shift in power from the Jews to the Italian partners. You still had Jews involved like, uh, like Lansky, um, but they were not, didn't have the power that they had before. Um, this is kind of an interesting story about Lepke. Um, Lepke was prosecuted by Dewey again, who, uh, in 1940, and then Dewey became governor of New York in 1942, and he wanted to be president. So he went to jail to visit Lepke, who's on death row, and he ordered him reprieve if he would rat on Amalgamated Clothing Workers Union president and FDR competent Sidney Hillman. He wanted to discredit FDR. Well, Dewey was planning to run against FDR in 44, and he did. Well, Lepke refused, and he went to the chair. He said, I'm not a rat. I'm a Democrat, and I love Roosevelt. I guess, again, there's honor among thieves. After World War II, Jewish mobsters, you know, like Lansky said, and, and, and Mickey Cohn on the West Coast, had power, and they, they controlled some groups, but the center shifted, and... Um, the, the power shifted to the mafia. You see, the thing is that Jewish American gangsters, they never passed it on to their children. That was the big difference. And as American Jews improved their conditions, Jewish thugs and racketeers either disappeared or assimilated. And Jew, Jews in America buried the memory of their gangster past. Many Jewish gangsters ended up in Las Vegas where they really became part of the community. Great philanthropists, strong supporters of the UJA and the Anti-Defamation League. So, but by, by and large, the, the Jewish American criminal organizations and gangs that once rivaled the Italians and the Irish during the first half of the 20th century, they were gone. Except in Florida. Okay, I'm going to touch on Miami. Gambling has been around in Florida since the late 19th century. Blansky fell in love with Florida. He built a, a mansion on Biscayne Bay in 1929. He thought it would be a great center for casinos and off-track betting. Uh, he invested in the Hollywood Kennel Club, Tropical Park, and Coral Gables, Gulfstream. Gulfstream, that was Lansky's baby. And using the, the uh, wire syndicate that was done by Annenberg, his gambling operation in Hallandale, Florida, he controlled Miami-Dade and Fort Lauderdale. By 1948, Lansky was owning 50 gambling interests here, including the Colonial Inn, you see the Colonial Inn, uh, also a famous nightclub. And then you had the Keefe Hour Commission. Many of you are old enough to remember that Keith Hour ran with Adlai Stevenson as vice president. Well, the Keith Hour uh, Commission on Crime came down really hard and 
Miami-Dade and Broward authorities had to, um, had to react. It was the end of an era. Lansky moved his operations um, to Havana. He lived in various places. He lived in, in Hollywood. Um, he lived uh, in Hallandale. And then finally in Miami Beach on Collins Avenue. So for those of you who still go to casinos, I want to share some advice from Maya Lansky. He said, don't gamble. You're not going to win. The house is going to win 83% of the time. But if you do gamble, play blackjack. Only chance you have to win. So you don't have to fix games if the house is going to win 83% of the time. So the paradox. These men were good to their mothers. Their mothers were a great influence on their Jewishness. The, the mothers were revered. They brought their mothers' homes. They visited them. They cared for them. Lansky said, Mama hated to see us go hungry. She was always ready to give us her share because like every Jewish mother in the neighborhood, she sacrificed herself for her children. Too often the sons saw their fathers as failures, struggling to get ahead when crime, that was an easy way to get status. Now Jewish mothers sacrificed, but they expected that their sons be Jews and maintain a connection. And whether they were believers or atheists in adulthood, these Jews continued the traditions they learned as a kid. Lansky was an atheist, but he maintained membership in Temple Sinai in Hollywood. He gave money for its upkeep, attended services on the holidays, gave a lot of money to Brandeis University and anything having to do with the state of Israel. At least during their mother's lifetimes, many of these tough Jewish mobsters obeyed mama, at least went to shul on the high holidays to please their mothers. Most of their closest friends and associates, associates in and outside of crime were Jews. They spoke Yiddish, they married Jewish women, at least their first wives, in ceremonies conducted by rabbis, they gave money to Jewish causes, they went to high holy day services, their sons were... Abe Rellis, incorrigible thug, loved mama. One Friday night, he had a contract to kill this guy named Johnny, but also every Friday night for Shabbos dinner, he had a gun to mama. He'd have gefilte fish, chicken soup with noodles and boiled chicken. So he invited Johnny to join him for Shabbos dinner with Bugsy Goldstein and they had dinner. And then he says, mama, here's some money, go to the movies. Remember these were traditional, but not really observant. So mama goes to the movies. In those days, they were double features. They murdered Johnny. Bugsy Goldstein disposed of the body parts. Uh, Rellis cleaned up. When his mother came home, he sat down with her for a glass of tea and a piece of honey cake. Even Nutty Bugsy and the rest of the syndicate put love of mother above everything. At a syndicate trial, Bugsy defended a person who had failed to obtain a getaway car. Why? He had to return to a dying mother. He was unanimously acquitted and there wasn't a dry eye in the house. How do they live two lives? This is called compartmentalization. It's the ability to separate your personal life and your business, what you do in your personal life and the way you behave in business, private and public. My mother had no idea of what her father really did. She thought grandpa went to work in a suit as a house painter. Families were kept separate. Mickey Cohn said, look, we had a code of ethics like the one among bankers and other people in other walks of life. You don't involve your wife. You don't involve your family in your work. I remember growing up, people would say, what does your father do? He goes to business. You didn't really know what they did unless they were like doctor, lawyer, Indian chief. They had a specific business. But in business, they went to business. That's all you knew. Children were protected. If fathers men made the magazines, they buy up whole issues and, and buy up all the newspapers to keep the information of their father's true identity out of the hands of the kids. They wanted the children to marry well, to become respectable, to be legit. Children went to the best schools, and of course, they entered the professions. 
Children remembered wonderful fathers who just happened to be gangsters if they found out, not gangsters who were their fathers. And again, the big difference, big difference. Most Italians stayed on the mean streets of their neighborhoods, but as soon as Jewish gangsters made some money, they went to the Upper West Side, they went to the suburbs, dressed well and wanted everyone to think they were successful businessmen. They didn't dress flashy, they didn't tell people what they did, and they never built tested on. The younger generation was never recruited. For Jewish gangsters, crime was not a way out of the system. It was actually a way into the system, a way to make money by their way into the American dream, not for themselves, but for their children. So with the bad comes the good, and we had our own inglorious bastards. And while the older, more respectable Jewish organizations couldn't figure out how to respond to the rampant anti-Semitism in America, um, how to break up the, bun the rallies, and they didn't want to alienate, alienate uh, non-Jewish supporters. Um, it was a dilemma for mainstream Jewish leaders. So Rabbi Stephen Wise, along with uh, New York State Judge Nathan Perlman, went to landscape and said, we need you to break up the bun rallies. We'll pay you, but we don't want you to kill anybody. Lansky accepted, would take no money, and was upset that he couldn't kill these Nazis. He said, I was a Jew. I felt for those Jews in Europe who were suffering. They were my brothers. So for one year, Lansky's men were breaking up these rallies and Nazi arms and legs and ribs were broken and skulls were cracked, but no one died, at least no one we know. Lansky said, we wanted to show them that we Jews were not gonna sit back and accept insult. We were no yeshiva bookers. My grandfather proudly beat up Nazis after a huge rally at Madison Square Garden on February 20th, 1939, billed as a pro-America rally. I'm gonna show you just a little bit of this. February 20th, 1939. Just months before Hitler invades Poland, it marks the deadliest war in history. Thousands of Nazis gather for a rally at an indoor arena. But this isn't Nuremberg or Berlin. This is Madison Square Garden in New York City. You all have heard of me through the Jewish controlled press. And the man speaking isn't a member of Adolf Hitler's inner circle. He's Fritz Julius Kuhn, a US citizen and head of the German-American Bund or association. Kuhn wanted a rally to celebrate George Washington's birthday. The first American fascist is what they called him. They signed a contract with Madison Square Garden. He said, okay, we agree. No swastikas, no anti-Semitic signs, none of that stuff. Of course, once the contracts were signed, those agreements went out the window. This program was produced for We love him for the enemies he has made. Ladies and gentlemen, Mr. Fritz Hughes. Kuhn then went on to deliver a, a very, very predictable and very, very typical National Socialist stump speech about racism and the Jewish conspiracy and the communists and how everybody's an enemy and everybody has to be alike. We, the German-American Bund, organized as American citizens with American ideals and determined to protest ourselves, our homes, our wives and children against the slimy conspirators and the parasite taint of Jewish communism in our schools, our universities, our very homes. Then... I can't take much more about it. Every time I've seen this, and I've, done, I've shown this hundreds of times, it still bothers me. But anyway, I was very, very proud. And my grandfather did tell me about his adventures at Madison Square Garden, beating up, when they came out, beating up um, those who attended. Now, Lansky was really upset because afterwards, the Jewish press berated these gangsters that they had actually hired um, and condemned them and actually condemned them in the press.
The other thing that Lansky did was naval intelligence went to him. There were problems with um, U-boats in New York Harbor. It was real. And um, Luciano is in jail and the Italian mafia is controlling uh, the waterfront. So they say, can you please go to him and arrange a deal to make sure that they provide security for all the docks in New York Harbor uh, and in exchange, we will put him in a minimum security uh, prison. And this, this did happen. German submarines were actually entering New York Harbor at this time. And um, one of the a boat called the Normandy, a ship called the Normandy, actually had been blown up there. So this was very, very real. The sabotaging was very real. So after World War II, my grandfather and many other fellow gang members ran guns for Israel. Grandpa stored them in his bathtub and had a shower at his Moctanus' house next door. Um, these tough guy gangsters applauded the bravery of Jews fighting the War of Independence, an image that contrasted so strongly with the images of the camps. The connection to Italian gangsters was very important, controlling the docks. This enabled smuggled guns to leave America on the way to the Haganah, and shipments to Arab countries were diverted into Jewish hands. Several Jewish American mobsters provided financial support for Israel through donations since 1948, and many tried to go uh, back to Israel under the law. Um, he fled to Israel. He, I don't know if it was because he was, yes, he was very pro-Israel. He raised a lot of money for Israel, but he also was trying to escape tax evasion charges. He was deported back to America on the orders of Golda Meir, two reasons. One, she was American. She grew up in America and she knew these gangsters and she feared them. But also the American government said, return Lansky to us or we're not gonna sell you the phantom jets that you need. Lansky died in Miami Beach in 1983. Beyond the support of Israel, Jewish gangsters were known for tremendous charity work and not just for Jewish charities. Um, during, the, uh, during the depression, uh, Longies Wellman supported the Catholic uh, Archdiocese of, New York's, of uh, Newark's soup kitchens. When money was given, whoever it was given, nobody ever asked where it came from, although everybody knew where it came from. So in closing, there's my grandpa shortly before his death with my grandmother, Julia. In 1957, I lived in Miami Beach on 12th and Pennsylvania, and they came to visit us in June. Louis took me to meet his cronies at the original Wolfies on Collins and 23rd. Grandma was not happy. She told my mother it was a shanda to bring me to shame, to, to bring me to see those men. I thought they were nice and they treated me well. What I recall most is how well they were dressed, including grandpa in dark suits with snappy fedoras in the middle of Miami Beach heat. When interviewed for my favorite book, which I'll show you in a minute, but he was good to his mother, Robert Rockaway said, the subjects weren't ashamed for what they did, but for any shame it might have brought to their families. But these guys supported relatives. They helped them get jobs. They helped them go to school. When my cousin Harvey could not get into an American medical school because of quotas, my grandfather and his cronies sent him to school in Zurich, Switzerland with mob money. He went on to become a colonel in the US Army and a, uh, a famous uh, cardiologist. Jewish gangsters made sure their kids lived normal lives, went to college. Sometimes they used muscle or money to convince reluctant schools to not let their kids in. Jewish children didn't marry the children of other gangsters. They did not inherit the business of crime. Gangsterism was a one generation career. These were men who had, or thought they had, they perceived that they had very few options in their lives and the underlings the soldiers, for the most part, were poor, uneducated schnooks. These were men who started out at the bottom in terrible working conditions. Possible to attain anything beyond a high school education when Jews were kept out of so many professions. We can judge these men, but we have to remember 
It was a different time, once upon a time in America. So these um, are three books that I highly recommend, The Rise and Fall of a Jewish Gangster in America. is re reads more like a textbook, but it's very comprehensive. But, his, but he was good to his mother, is delightful. And as you could see that it's very well, well worn. My favorite though is Tough Jews by Rich Cohn. So on that, I thank you all very much. Um, thank you very much, Helene. Um, if you have any questions, I mean, this, this was brilliant. And we, you know, and finding about your history as well is just so fascinating. Um, what I like is if you have any questions or comments, would you please put them in the chat since um, you can't all be seen on the screen necessarily. But also what I'm going to do is I'm going to read um, a couple of comments that were here. Okay, um, Ron Aaron's, okay, we see that everyone. Mandy Weiss and Harry Pittsburgh, Phil Strauss, both died in the electric chair along with Lefty Buckhalder on the same day within minutes of each other. Each received 10 to 11 amps from the electric chair. If you stick your finger into a wall socket, you'll receive a shock from just one amp. Very interesting. Okay, um, and, and Linda said five, five million today, uh, um, five million in 1929 is equal to about 76 million today. Okay, now if there are any other questions, uh, please feel free to type them into the I, chat. I wanna... I just want to say one thing about Lepke when he turned himself in and he was on the lam and he turned himself in um, to Walter Winchell, to Walter Winchell and Walter Winchell gave him a mezuzah to wear. And, and I think he died wearing the mezuzah that well, Walter Winchell was a Jew also. A lot of people don't know that. Uh, yes, they generally marry Jewish women. At least their first wives, but most of them didn't marry Jewish and they were, it was a, a they were Jewish, you know, they went to shul. Uh, the kids had bar mitzvahs, you know, and yes, most of them married Jewish women. And if they didn't marry a Jewish woman, they married an Italian woman. But mostly married Jewish women. What's interesting to me is also how that they were, were all over the country. For sure. Okay. Thanks. That the last comment was from question was from Michael Cotton. Are there any other questions for Helene? Ah, and Helene, you can read them. They're right there. We can all read them. It's one. I'm so glad. I love. I love Benny Rock. We 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 look at you as who we want to be in our sisterhood at at the uh, BTB uh, Temple Beth Torah Sharet Sedek. You know, and now we, we got Shul Cloud finally. So we're hoping that we could have a good sisterhood website. We've been very, our sisterhood, believe it or not, is growing. So I'm really happy about that. That's wonderful. I'm going to put in ours. I'm so glad to do this. I had a rough day broken dishwasher, refrigerator, some medical issues, on and on and on. I have a program to do and I, for, I forgot that I had a program tomorrow night. <laughs> so, is, oh. is it the same one? No, actually, I'm actually going to host it. We're doing, uh, this is a, I should put you in touch with this woman. I've actually hired her um, as a paid speaker from Nova, but I'm, um, she's president of Sisterhood in Pembroke Pines. Um, so I'm doing a program on the Jews of Cuba for her. And in turn, she's doing Jewish pirates. And I know people have done it. They said it's fabulous program. So I'm going to work with her on that. Wonderful. But you guys well, have my list, right? You have my list of all my stuff. I believe Terry, uh, Terry Jonas does. Terry. Yeah, I sent her an updated list um, with everything on there. And mm -hmm. I, you know, again, the, the the Morocco. Have I done Morocco for you? No, you haven't. Not yet. Love it. My favorite we, place. We would love to hear about Morocco. It's on my uh, bucket list to, to visit. Okay. Well, I I want to. If, if there aren't any other questions, 
Um, I, I want to thank you once, once again, Helene, and I want to thank everybody who has who attended tonight um, from near and far. Um, we greatly appreciate your support in attending our programs and uh, I can't promote, you know, like that because I'm representing sisterhood. Join us if you are available. I have to tell you that sisterhood saved my sanity in the last during the pandemic. It really did. It saved my that and Zoom. I, you know, it saved my sanity. Um, it's just I, I never thought that I'd be involved in a sisterhood. I never thought that I would be president of a sisterhood. And I tell people it's not your grandma's sisterhood. You know, these are people who do. So, right. you know, we had we had to think outside of the proverbial box of oh, oh meeting, meetings have to be in person. Uh, I mean, we're we're doing it on the sister. I mean, the synagogue board. We're doing it for meetings, you know. And it's wonderful because people don't have to travel. The only thing we miss is the is the human contact, which you know we're have, starting to have a little bit of that. We but are you open for services? Are you open? Yes, for we service? are. Yeah. Yes, we so are. I find myself going every Friday night and every Saturday morning. It's it's a, it's it's yes, it's religious, but it's also social. That's right. You know, because you know, we still need that. Keep, and that I've been content. actually, I was asked they needed, they wanted to make sure that they had, you know, Minion. So I'm going to Minion at 7.45 every morning, but I have to get dressed. <laughs> I can't go on my night count. So um, <laughs> anyway, but thank you. It's my pleasure. It is my pleasure, my pleasure to do lectures for, for your sisterhood, really. Well, we, we appreciate you know, you sharing your knowledge and your great, you know, presentations Thank too. You. Passion. Can you believe that when I was younger, I couldn't speak publicly ever? Now you put a mic in my hand, I can't shut my mouth. Anyway, <laughs> I think I deserve a glass of wine. So I'm going okay. to celebrate my presentation. Thank you all very much. Thanks. And if anybody wants to stay on afterwards, I'm just going to stop recording. Okay.